completely unprecedented. And because of this, the potential for us to rise, the potential for us to do things that we cannot do anywhere else are also new. That's why I said this is a historic and this is also an unprecedented reality. This is an exciting time to live in, but it's also a dangerous time. On the flip side, it's also a very, very dangerous time. Why is it dangerous, brothers and sisters? It is dangerous because with those very freedoms that some of us will capitalize on, some of us will maximize the potential, yet others, yet others are going to misuse and abuse those freedoms, yet others are going to not understand the priorities of their faith. The freedom that gives me the right to be a Muslim, the freedom that gives my sister the right to wear a hijab, the freedom that gives us the right to come here today and nobody has to get approval and we're building our masjid and our community. It also gives others the freedom to explore things that might not be ethical, to do and to live lifestyles that are not conducive to our sharia. Those types of freedoms are not found by and large in Muslim majority lands. There are checks and balances in Muslim majority countries where certain things are not allowed to do in public. Community comes in, society comes in, family comes in and prevents you from going too far on the spectrum. Well, in this land, with the positives of some freedoms, also come negatives of other freedoms. And we currently have a number of crises that we are facing. One of the biggest crises that we are facing, one of the biggest crises that every faith-based community is facing, is the rise of what is called the nuns. By nuns, I don't mean Catholic nuns wearing the headscarf, no. Not N-U-N-S. The rise of the N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. Gallup survey last year released an article, released a, a, a latest poll that demonstrated that, and this is a scary statistic, up to 30% of millennials no longer identify with the religion of their parents. One third, one third, of millennials do not identify with the religion of their parents. And this is a universal problem in every faith tradition. Muslim, Catholic, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Orthodox, Jews, Reform, every single faith tradition is struggling with the rise of the nuns. We used to say, when I was a child growing up in the 80s, I was born in Houston, Texas, grew up in the 80s, so we used to say, Islam is the fastest growing religion. Well, I have news for you. That's no longer the case. The fastest growing religion is no religion. The rise of the nuns. And we as Muslims should never feel a sense of of, of arrogance, a sense of complacency that's not happening amongst us. No, it is happening. Speak to any youth counselor, speak to any sheikh, speak to any community activist, and dare I say, dear parents, speak to your fellow parents. Every one of you sitting here who is actively involved in the community is well aware that this is a phenomenon. I didn't have to face this growing up. When I grew up in the 80s, sure, we had our ups and downs, but I didn't know a single person of our batch and era that left Islam and came about them. That didn't happen in our generation. But times have changed. Situations have changed. And what we have now is the rise of a new generation that is questioning, that is probing, that is not really embracing embracing our ideals and values. Iman is not coming into their hearts. You know, I travel across the country and one thing truly frightens me. You go to the average masjid, you go to the average masjid and you will find plenty of youngsters. You will find plenty of people who are being brought by their parents. You will find middle age, you will find elderly, but you will not find by and large a good percentage of them working class. From 25 to 40, you will not find a lot of people. As for college and high school, they're not gonna come to our masajid, they should be praying in their local places. But once you get out of college, once you graduate, once you're in the workforce, you should be coming for Jum'ah. Next time you go for Jum'ah, just scan the audience. Scan the audience for those that are fresh college graduates, for those that are in their mid to late 20s. 
And chances are, chances are, they are underrepresented in every community. I've noticed this myself. And this is frightening because if our next generation does not even have that much Iman that they're going to sacrifice a Friday afternoon to come for Jumu'ah from work, if they don't have enough courage and stamina to request from their bosses, hey boss, I'm going to need a longer Jumu'ah break, a longer Friday lunch. If they don't have that much Iman, then what's going to happen down the line? They might not actually be murtad. If you ask them, are you Muslim? Oh, of course I'm Muslim. But if you're not even going to sacrifice for Jumu'ah, then frankly, how much Iman do you have? And if this is your percentage, what's going to happen to your children after you? And we have another, uh, many, many crises are taking place of them. And again, I'm sorry to be blunt, brothers and sisters, but you know, my frankness or bluntness or hiding the truth is not going to change the reality. And somebody has to tell you the facts as they are. Another major crisis we have is our youngsters marrying outside the faith. Boys and yes, even girls. And I know almost every one of you knows acquaintances, maybe even relatives that have married outside the faith. Now, I'm not going to get into the haram and halal of a young man marrying a kitabi lady. I will say, forget the haram and halal. I will say, if all of our men did this, our community is going to fizzle out and die. That for sure I will say. Let's leave the haram and halal. If all of our young men, a majority of our young men, even a large percentage of our young men, marry outside the faith, what's going to happen to our sisters? And more importantly than that as well, what is going to happen to the children of these men who have married kitabiyat ladies? Their children, how much iman are they going to have? These are all crises and dangers that are unprecedented. So, along with the exciting times, along with the opportunities and potentials, we have some major potential dangers as well. And that's why I said unchartered as well. This is unchartered. What's happening right now? The reality of the American Muslim situation? It is extremely unchartered. And every single community, you see, we don't have a unified leadership. And frankly, brutally honest, we're never going to have a unified leadership because unified leadership requires state behind it. When you don't have state, you cannot have unified leadership. In Muslim lands, whether you like them or not, there's going to be a unified leader. There's an army, there's a system, there's a court, there's a government, there's a currency. Whether you like the guy or not, he is your president, prime minister, king, whatever it might be. There is some level of unity and stability that comes with that, pros and cons. Here in America, Every single group of Muslims can be independent and they are independent. So, rural practices, again, I'm just telling you it as it is. Every masjid, every community, every group of people, they have to come together. Like you are coming together. And they have to become a mini government, a mini state. They have to take charge of things that back home others would take charge. You guys didn't sign up for this when you came here from Hyderabad or Karachi. You didn't think that I'm going to have to micro manage my child's education. Khair, that was not on your agenda when you came. But you know what? With the coming of your generation, my parents' generation to this land, and with you establishing your roots here, you have to understand that home is no longer where your grandfather is buried. Home is where your grandchildren are going to be born. And once you understand this reality, that this is your home, this notion of going back, please, you know it's not going to happen, right? I hope this is now out of your minds now. Even my father came here in 1962, the first Pakistani to come to Houston, Texas. Those of you who know my father, you know, mashallah, he's still with me now, 88 years old, make dua for him, he's living with me now. Alhamdulillah, his health is on the decline, but alhamdulillah, he's living with me now. First Pakistani Muslim to come to Houston, Texas. The founder of the MSA, the founder of the first masjid back in the 60s, or early 70s, before I was born, he founded ISJ, which the famous conglomerate in Houston. He didn't sign up to build Masajid. He didn't come here to start the MSA. It wasn't his goal to start Sunday school. But guess what? I was born, my brother was here. Things have to be done. And whether 
whether he signed up for this or not, responsibilities came to him. And so, even though he wasn't trained in management, he wasn't trained to be an imam, he wasn't trained to give the khutbah, he had to take on these responsibilities. He had to build the first masjid, he had to carve out the first Sunday school. And Alhamdulillah, from back in the time up until now, you know, ISGH in Houston has, Alhamdulillah, established its track record. Across the country, people like my father have come, most of them after 70s, 80s, 90s, but the same story. And now we are seeing this story over here. Now we are seeing this story over here, where a community has come together. A community has understood, for the sake of our children, we need to put our ethnic differences aside, our political differences aside, maybe even to a large extent, much of our theological differences aside. We have to come together for the greater good. The love of our children and the love of Iman is allowing us to come to this room, all of us, from different backgrounds, from different societies, from different even levels of Islam and understandings of Islam. But what unites us all is the love of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the desire that our children maintain this legacy after us. Now with all of this, with all of this comes responsibility and vision. And again, much can be said, but subhanAllah, this is something that I study a lot. I mean, many of you know I love history, my PhD is in theology, but I love history and I love studying history. If I had the energy and time to do a second PhD, it would be in history. I love history. And I've been studying the history of not just Islam and Muslims, but especially the history of Islam in the West. It is one of my areas I have a passion for. And when I'm studying the history of Islam in the West, a number of things piqued my interest and frankly, made me very curious and also very scared. You see, I say we live in unprecedented times. This is the first time 50 million Muslims in Western lands are living, that is true. But 100 years ago, a much smaller group of Muslims migrated to America and to South America. 100 years ago, precisely, 1910 to 1920. Some came in the 1900s, but around 1900 to 1910, the first batch of Muslim immigrants came to this land. Before this point in time, the only Muslims were forcibly brought. You know, the, uh, our uh, African American brothers who came as slaves, 20% of them were Muslim. 20% of the slaves that came, of the, those people that were forcibly brought here, they came from Muslim backgrounds. Obviously, they could not preserve their Islam, and Islam as a religion died amongst them. The first group that actually came as Muslim immigrants, they came from the Ottoman Empire, specifically from Bilad al-Sham, because there was a drought taking place there, people were dying, there was no economic opportunity. You have to realize, America in 1910-1920 was not a nice place to come to. You didn't want to migrate to this land as a brown-skinned person. You would face a lot of challenges, you would face a lot of issues. The only people that came here, they were starving back home. They needed a place to come. And so, small pockets of Ottomans, of uh, Arabs in the Ottoman lands, they came here. By and large, very few Indians came. Very few, you can literally count them as a few dozen. There are stories here and there. But very few Indians came because India was stable. There was plenty of wealth and there was safety and security. You're not gonna leave that for America. Now, around 10,000 Muslims came. Around 10,000 Muslims. Most of them settled in Idaho uh, and um, up north in Canada as well. And in Nebraska there were a few as well. In Iowa, also in Detroit. And that's why Detroit to this day, mashallah, has you know, so many uh, uh, people of Muslim heritage. If you look at their history, same time they went to South America, they went to Argentina, they went to the Caribbean islands. If you look at their history, by and large, the descendants of those Muslims four generations ago, the majority of them are no longer Muslim. The majority of them are no longer Muslim. Yes, there are pockets here and there. I have visited the communities where the first Masajid were founded. And I've asked around that yes, there are still some of the descendants, but I spoke to one of them, it was right before COVID, I was in uh, their, their, their city, and he was telling me, the majority of my uncles and cousins are Christians. He reconverted to Islam in the 90s. He re-embraced Islam, but he was telling me the majority of my cousins and uncles are actually Christian. And the same in South America. In fact, in South America, hardly anybody remained a Muslim for four generations. 
really sad story which has a good ending. The president of Argentina in the 90s, the president of Argentina in the 90s was actually one of the great great grandchildren of one of those Muslim immigrants. And he was born with a Muslim name, Muhammad. And he grew up and at the age of 18 when he entered university, he decided he wants to run for politics and so his Muslim heritage will be a disservice to him. So he changed his name to Carlos Menendez. Look him up. Carlos Menendez was the president of Argentina in the 90s. He changed his name to Carlos Menendez. And the rest, as they say, is history. He kept on working in politics, working, working, until finally he became the president of the country. And he lived a successful career, he finished his presidency, and he retired, and alhamdulillah, thum, alhamdulillah, the year before he passed away, he reconverted to Islam, and he died a Muslim, and in his wasiyah he told his children to bury me in a Muslim graveyard. But he did this the year before he passed away, so he's actually buried in a Muslim graveyard. But still, for the bulk of his life, he identified as and prayed in a Christian church. And he was publicly a Christian, people did not know his Muslim heritage. I say this story to you because this is a stark reality of what happened 100 years ago. We have this living example. Now, in the Western world, there was one exception that I found. One exception. That exception was South Africa. South Africa. If any of you have been to South Africa, you will know that the Muslims there are fourth, fifth, sixth generation. They came even before 1910. They, their, their migration began in 1880. The Gujaratis, the, the British of course, they ruled in India and South Africa. And so they could migrate to South Africa as indentured servants. And they stayed there for four or five generations now. They have cut off the roots from India. They of course, you know, look Indian, but they've lost Gujarati, they don't speak the language. Alhamdulillah, they still eat biryani and there's mirchi in their food, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But the language is gone, and you know, by and large, they're, where they're from, they you don't really know, they just know a vague idea. Now the point being, I visited, I've been to South Africa half a dozen times. My first visit there was back in 2004, 2005, literally like 15, 17 years ago. My first visit, I hadn't started studying, um, you know, the history of Islam in, in Western lands, and I just, landed in South Africa to give some lectures, and I was shocked to see Muslims everywhere. Even though the percentage of Islam in South Africa is similar to us, one, two, three percent, not that much, but they're visibly Muslim. There are beers, mashallah, hijabs everywhere, and then they, the, the brothers told me, I think in Durban, I forgot which city, all the chicken is halal because the Muslims run all the chicken industry, alhamdulillah. Everywhere, wherever you go, it's all halal. You don't have to ask about it. This was back in the time, I don't know about now, so ask about now. I was honestly shocked. You guys came in 1880, and yet your Islam is thriving. You have madaris. You have, you know, the only Western country that would send Qur'an, Qaris, to participate in Egypt and Dubai and win competitions in the 1980s was South Africa. Now, alhamdulillah, America has just entered the seat three or four years ago. Alhamdulillah, we now have our youth participating in Dubai and Egypt and in Qatar and other places. But in the 80s, the only Western country was South Africa that had a Qari trained in South Africa participating at the international level. I was shocked. And it so happened that in one of the events that I had, they pointed out to me a professor, uh, she's passed away uh, since that time, Allah Alhamdulillah. She was at the time 92 years old. So this is 2005 or so. She was 92 years old. Very intelligent lady. She handed me her autobiography, signed, I still have it to this day. Her grandfather migrated to South Africa. Think about that. She's 92. Her grandfather migrated to South Africa. So when I met her, first thing I said, Auntie, I have a blunt question, I hope you don't mind. She said, yes, what? I said, Auntie, I've traveled so many states and countries, I've never seen Islam thrive the fourth, fifth, sixth generation like I have in South Africa. You were born here, your grandfather came, can you explain to me anecdotally, can you explain to me how Islam survived so long and so powerfully? instantaneously. You know what she said to me? The madrasa. Instantaneously, she said the madrasa. 
My grandfather, when he came to this land, even before building a masjid, he built a school for his children. And I studied in that school. I said, wait, wait, auntie, you study in a madrasa? She said, yes. I said, wait, but I know for a fact that in India at the time, they were not sending women to madrasas. In India at the time, where your grandfather came from, women were not going to madrasas. And she said, yes, I know. But my grandfather realized that if they wanted to make their children Muslim, they would have to educate their daughters. They would have to make sure their daughters are pious Muslims. So they made sure that they're educating women as well. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters. Subhanallah. When she said this, it just clicked in my mind. And I went and did the research, and it is exactly as she said. When the Muslims came here, they did build masajid in Iowa, in Idaho. They built masajid across these small pockets, but they didn't build communities. They didn't build madrasas. When they went to South America, they built neither masajid nor madrasas. They didn't build anything. So when they didn't build institutions, how will Islam survive? How are you going to pass down your faith? to your children and grandchildren. You see, let me speak bluntly to all of you who chose to come to this land. And you, you made a wise choice, inshallah, there's nothing wrong with that, it's not a sin. You made a choice to come here for your education, for the stability of living, for the finances. But the fact of the matter, and I know because I spoke to my father about this, you guys weren't thinking two, three, four generations ahead, which is fine. You're 25 at the time, you're 30 at the time. You're not really thinking of your grandchildren, okay. But now that you're here, now that you're here, you need to reorient your priorities. Allah has blessed you with education. Allah has blessed you with wealth. Most of you are living lifestyles you could never have imagined when you came to this land, when you left your countries back home. Allah has blessed you. Alhamdulillah. Now that you are this blessed, it is time to reorganize your priorities. The priority is not your bank account. The priority is your children and the iman of your children. The priority is not how big you build your house. The priority is how strong iman is in your son and daughter's heart. And back home where you came from, even if you were not that religious, family and society came and put checks and balances on you and your children. Even if you were not praying five times a day back home, at least society teaches your children morality. Everybody's fasting Ramadan. There are things you don't do in public and even in private amongst dignified people. Society and family have checks and balances. Well, guess what? By you coming here, you have lifted all checks and balances of society. You have to understand this point. By you coming here, and I'm not criticizing you, Honestly, I thank Allah I was born in this country. I thank Allah for the education, for the mind that I have. I wouldn't have it anywhere else. So there are pros that come, but there are also cons. By you coming here, you have removed the checks and balances back home. Therefore, it is upon you to bring forth a new set of checks and balances. It is upon you. It is obligatory on you because you have left one set of checks and balances to now bring forth a new set of checks and balances. And this leads us to why we are here today. The number one mechanism to preserve the Iman of your children. I want everybody to listen to me. All of you, please listen to me. This is very important. The number one mechanism to save the Iman of your children, I'm going to be super blunt. It is not the masjid, it is not the madrasa. It is the home. It is the home. It is you and your spouse and how you live your life. The number one mechanism to preserve Iman in your children is how you and your spouse live your life and how much Islam you have and how much Islam is shown inside of the house. When you practice Islam in the house, when you show your children the reality of what it means to be a believer in a godless world, the reality of what it means to be a moral person in an immoral society, that is the number one mechanism and nothing comes close to that. But you know, we can't fundraise for you and your spouse's inner morality and household Islam. You're gonna have to do that on your own. Yes, we're here to help you, ilm-wise, akhlaq-wise, whatever we can. But 
I can't do fundraisers to help you in your house with your spouse and how you live your life. That's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That is the number one mechanism. Number two after that is Islamic communities. And by this I mean the type of centers you guys are building here. And people across the country are building. You see, and with these few points I'll finish it all time. Brothers and sisters, parents, the religion of Islam, listen to me again, before I leave the stage and let's say the rest is up to all of you. From my experiences, from my studies, from my travels, my analysis is as follows and inshallah all of you will agree with me. The religion of Islam is not just a series of do's and do nots. It's not just throwing your kid at Sunday school and him memorizing the last 10 surahs and him learning a list of what they need to do and what they need to believe. No! The religion of Islam is a lived reality. It is an experiential, it is an experiential experience. Your child must see what it is to live the life of a Muslim, to grow up amongst Muslims, to be amongst Muslims. That is the real religion of Islam. Not what they memorize for one hour on Sunday school, what they live their life with. And that is why these community centers that you're building, which has the masjid, but along with the masjid, schools, gymnasiums, playgrounds, mini ummas is what it is. These are your checks and balances. You've left the checks and balances back home. Now it is upon you to duplicate, to replicate, to bring forth a new series of checks and balances. And after the family, after you and your spouse, the best series of checks and balances is to have these mini community centers where our children will not just go and pray Jumu'ah, not just pray Taraweeh, but experience life as a Muslim. Live amongst groups of people. Their friendship should be within the Muslim community. Their marriages have to be within the Muslim community. How is that going to happen if you don't set up many ummas, many model cities like the one that you guys are planning over here? And it makes me very happy to see that you have this vision. No masjid should only be just a musalla. Living in the western lands, every masjid has to be more than a place for Jumu'ah and a place for Taraweeh. Every masjid has to be a mini community center, a mini life backbone of the ummah. And this is what your community is planning. So my final point to you brothers and sisters, gone are the days, gone are the days in the 80s and early 90s where one or two rich, you know, mashallah Muslims from Arab, rich, uh, from oil rich countries would come and their students here and they say, oh mashallah, here's a check for $100,000. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. We saw them back in the 90s and in the 80s. Those days are long gone. And every community, speak to me, I have been to over 500 communities. Every community is struggling like you are. Every community is having its own fundraisers. So I'm telling it to you bluntly, you won't get help from outside. And why should you? These are your kids. Everybody's struggling with their kids. You need to step up to the plate and save your children. This is your masjid, it is your community, it is your faith, it is your sons and daughters. So, my final plea to you is very simple. When you give to these types of projects, do not just think, oh, this is a masjid, inshallah Allah will reward me. Of course Allah will reward you. But it's not just about, oh, this is a masjid. No, what we are doing today is creating history. What we are doing today is planting the seeds of Islam for generations to come. These institutions are fortresses of Iman for my sons and your sons, for my daughters and your daughters. These institutions are the primary mechanism whereby Islam will live generations and generations to come. So Allah has given you the opportunity. Right here, right now, tonight and today, Allah has given you the opportunity to have the greatest salat jariya. You shall have the first domino tonight. You shall have that opportunity that later generations will wish they had. Today you have the opportunity to contribute to a building, a structure that inshallah will be a legacy for
for generations to come. How many tens of thousands of people will come here, be inspired, protect their iman? How many young sons and daughters? How many teenagers will come? And for whatever thing that happens, a little bit of iman stays into their heart. A little bit of flicker of the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nur of the Quran, it comes into their heart. And the sadaqa jariya will go to all of us who are here today, the very first day, understanding this is an opportunity that will never come again. Brothers and sisters, we live in historic times. We live in exciting times. We live in dangerous times. We live in unchartered times. Every one of us has the potential to leave a lasting legacy. Every one of us has the potential to become a hero for generations to come. Not by our names for our children, but in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So rise up to the challenge. Do what is necessary and understand Allah has given you amazing potential and opportunity in this time that you would not have anywhere else. Make dua to Allah to protect your children. Make dua to Allah to preserve your iman and legacy. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every one of us here and every one of us in this community and every Muslim couple in this land to preserve iman and Islam in their hearts and to preserve iman and Islam in the hearts of their children. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us and our children of those who establish the prayer, of those who fast Ramadan, of those who love the Quran, of those who believe in Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the kalima of la ilaha illallah to remain in our progeny generation after generation until the trumpet is blown. I seek refuge in Allah from any of our children and grandchildren and their children after them leaving this faith. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us and our children to the best of manners, the best of akhlaq, the best of iman. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and our children from everything that is evil, every indecency, every evil sin, every evil companionship. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our ummah in this land, to be role model ummahs, to be global citizens that people around us aspire to, look up to, and take advantage of. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we walk in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we become role models to our friends and colleagues and neighbors around us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live as Muslims, to die as Muslims, and to be resurrected with the righteous and the father whom wa hasbun wa laikum rafiqa wa jazakum allahu khayran wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh